You're listening to episode 96, Samara's Story, A Son with an Ependymoma Brain Tumor. Hello, my friends. I am Katie Taylor, certified child life specialist and host of the Child Life On Call podcast. I'm so happy you're here today to introduce you to Samara and her story about her son. And this is the kind of person that she is. When I have guests on the podcast, I send them a quick form to fill out so I can get to know them. And one of the questions is, what would you tell another parent who's going through a similar situation? And do you want to know what she wrote? I'm here to talk if you need me. This is the kind of person that she is. So she's got lots of wisdom and takes us through the whole journey of her son having a head tilt and then getting diagnosed with a brain tumor, which she equates to being basically like getting on a train that never stops um, and you didn't know you had a ticket for it. Another thing that she wrote to me, which I just think is really timely when you think about the season that we're in right now and the holidays and the pressure to show up and look cute and do holiday pictures and savor the moment. And her advice to other parents is just to be present. And I think that's something that we can do. So as you listen to her story, be present with her words and then take the wisdom that she's giving to you and go throughout the rest of your day or your week. And of course, please share the story because their story deserves to be shared and she has so much to offer. So Let's get started with Samara's story. You want to just start off talking about you and your family and where you guys come from? Sure. Um, So my name is Samara and we live uh, in Massachusetts, north of Boston. And it's my husband and I, and we have an older daughter and a son. Daughter's eight and my son is uh, five. And... um, I'm very grateful that we live in this area for kind of all of the resources that are available here and for the childhood cancer world, really because of the amazing medical care that is here. Um, When my son was first diagnosed and I just was like, oh, we're in the right place because there, I couldn't think of a better place to be in terms of hospitals and social work and care and everything. So yeah, so just really grateful for for the location. Um, I think the whole process is kind of filled with like, looking back, you find these things that are the silver linings, right. That you didn't quite realize like there and the medical care is definitely a piece of it. Having, you know, our family nearby has been helpful as well. So, um, I can tell you a little bit about kind of how we kind of came into this world. Um, yeah. So my son, right before he turned two, we were, um, at the playground one day and he just kept tripping. Like he, he fell like three times in like the half an hour that we were there. And it was just very unusual. Cause he's, he was like a very kind of active kid. And so like to trip and fall over nothing that you could see just struck me as odd. Um, and then I noticed that his head was like slightly tilted to the side and it was very subtle, but I was like, some, I just had this like feeling something's not right. So we went to the doctor actually that afternoon. Um, and the doctor was like, yeah, you know, it's probably no big deal. Um, but just, I can tell you're worried. And he's like, why don't you just go, why don't you get an MRI just to kind of rule things out and be, be or cat scan, I think is what he said at the time, be safe. Um, so I came back home and my husband and I, we were talking about, should we do it? Does, you know, does it make sense to do this? Cause we had to go through like the hospital to do it. We couldn't, um, but we decided, okay, like, but like, I have this feeling, let's just do it. It's probably nothing like he said, but you know, um, yeah. to be safe. And, and so that scan showed that he had, that he had a brain tumor, um, So that was kind of an unexpected finding, of course. And um, yeah, ever since that moment, things changed forever, right? Like you hear news like that. And um, I just kind of remember, like, I felt like the floor just fell and everything just kind of, um, you know, I I thought it was like the end of the world pretty much was my uh, feeling at the moment. And it was the end of something that we knew, but it was also, um, 
you know, we began a new type of journey, I guess. Um, so from that moment, it was very high speed. Like um, once they kind of figured out what was going on, he had, it was called an ependymoma. Um, and we just went, it was right before Thanksgiving. And uh, they were like, go home, enjoy Thanksgiving. And I was like, enjoy Thanksgiving. What? It was, it was on, I don't remember what day of the week, but we were, they sent us home for the weekend. So it must've been like Thursday or Friday. So we were home for the weekend. Then he had to come back on, um, Tuesday morning for the surgery. And, um, I was like, I just remember that we have some photographs of that weekend. We had like, you know, we tried to be as normal as possible. We went to the park, you know, but like, we're all just like depressed, and like not, of course. You know, yeah. Like, um, so it was very, that was a very surreal thing um, to have. That. I, I am grateful that we did have some of that time. I know a lot of people have to like rush right into surgery and, and don't even have to think about it, but we had to wait for this special uh, machine that they use at the hospital that they don't have in every operating room. And it was available like on the Tuesday and that's why, and, and I guess he was stable enough that we could do that. So in a way it was good that there was some time, but it was a, it was a very odd, like this holding waiting pattern and, yeah. you know, is this the last time we're ever going to see him? And, you know, I mean, just like all these crazy thoughts that yeah. um, you can't help, but have. Um, yeah. That actually aren't so crazy, you know, right, right, right. you right. just no, get told your son has a, a brain tumor and it's like, how do you, how do you process that and celebrate Thanksgiving? It seems right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So talk me, talk to me about that. When you got the news, um, were you and your husband able to be together during that? And, and what was that like? So that was actually, it was probably like thinking about it. One of the more painful parts of the story, because so I have, as I said, I have an older daughter and, and, and my younger son. So I was home with our daughter while my husband took my son to the hospital to get the scan. And, you know, when you go to the hospital, it's it, for, for some reason, it, it ended, the, ended up happening like in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So even though we went, he went like at five or six o'clock, it wasn't until like two or three in the morning that, that we got the scan and we got the results. So my husband called me at two or three in the morning. I was asleep. He actually, like I didn't hear the phone at first. So he called and left a message and he called back like a minute later. And I did hear it the second time. Thank goodness. I mean, I had the phone like literally next to my yeah. head, but I, I wasn't. And so I was like, you know, he's, he's a mess because he's the one receiving this news. He's also a physician. So like, he knows enough, like a lot. And that is almost harder, I think. Um, mm. cause he's seen a lot. Um, so that, so that was, a, a, I just feel so awful that he was alone with that news before we could actually talk and pro and, and then I wake up and he tells me, and then I was like, I think my first response was like, this is a joke, right? Like, this is a bad joke. Not that he would ever joke about something, but like, I just couldn't, I couldn't even believe it. And then I was like, Oh no, no, this is real. This is real. Um, and then I was up and then I, I don't think I slept again for like six months, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I just, um, it was just so shocking and it was so hard not to be able to be together to process the news. Um, and then the next morning I was like, okay, we need, you know, someone needs to come and watch my daughter. I need to get to the hospital. And so that's kind of what happened is yeah. we family take over at that point. And then we were together at the hospital and my son was never alone at the hospital. There was always one yeah. or both of us there for weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is after his surgery, there's probably a recovery component to brain surgery. And yeah. when did they start treatment after that? So, um, he was in the hospital for a good, um, three weeks, like after the surgery, they, they want to start as soon as possible, but he needed to be like kind of strong enough to withstand it. So I think we, it was like the middle to end of December that we, um, got out of the hospital and he started his radiation, which was six weeks of radiation um, in January. So it was a pretty quick, and his, he did not do well in the hospital. Like he was, I don't know if any kid really does well in the hospital, but mm -hmm. um, he stopped talking and he, I mean, he was little, right? So, but he, 
before the surgery, he was chatty and he wouldn't say a word and he didn't start talking again until we got home, literally. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that was like three weeks of, you know, not talking and he, he couldn't sit up. He couldn't hold his head. It was like, he went back to like infancy. Mm. Um, and I'm sure there was, of course, you know, pain and discomfort associated with the surgery, but he couldn't tell us. Right. But then I think more was like this, like, um, like a psychological pain of what he just mm. went through that he also couldn't tell us, but I could tell with the not talking and the, um, he couldn't swallow. He had a feeding tube. I mean, it was a lot of stuff, but it really was like back to birth. My husband and I said it was like, it was like a rebirth. And, mm. you know, thankfully over the course of a year, really a year, like some, a lot of those things started to come back. Like he was able to hold up his neck. He, when he, I remember the first time he pulled himself up at home, like, so he could stand, it was like, you know, and, and yeah. that was in, in like in December or yeah, late December, early January, he did that again. So it was like, you know, when he could sit up by himself, it was all these things. It was like the milestones again. And we didn't know if he would reach them, you know, yeah. as a part of the recovery. So there was, um, yeah, a lot of uncertainty for sure, but a lot of joy when he did, when we saw that, you know, well, first of all, that he survived the surgery, but that he was coming back to be the boy that we knew. Um, and, you know, he had a deficits, he still does, but he um, has really caught up in, in a way that we never expected. Um, mm what you know like he can he can eat now and swallow and all these you know but it was like these are things that I will never take for granted um, yeah. because of having lost them and you know and the speaking I mean we weren't sure if he's going to speak again like yeah. so just all these so much question um a lot of uh, it's hard to live with that unknown yeah a lot of unknowns um yeah I think a lot a lot about you know, him not talking in the hospital. And I'm sure there were lots of factors, like you said, medical factors, but the psychological factors too. And one thing we see a lot is that children in the hospital really don't get to control much, but the one thing they do control is their voice. And when they choose to talk and if they don't feel like it, like they're not going to. Yeah, and I totally can see that. And, I, and the fact that he got home and started talking again, it's like, guess what? I do what I want. Right. Exactly. <laughs> when I want to. Yeah. Yeah. And as he's gotten older, that's definitely like his personality. He's a very Is strong it? kid. And so it just, it totally suit suits that that's, you know, I, I know for kids that have been through, you know, medically involved, like this is it, it's hard. There's so much that's be out of their control. Um, so yes, he, that was what he could control. Um, so thinking about your husband being a physician, did he take on a lot of the, the uh, appointments and checking with doctors and the symptoms or what roles did you guys play in his treatment? Uh, well, the first thing he, he did, he took out like his medical <laughs> textbooks from like, you know, um, from medical school about like the brain. And really we, we both just got like educated because this was like, even like our PCP or my son's a pediatrician like she has never seen one of these in her practice right in, in like 30 or 40 years like it's just not that right. common so we just kind of him more than myself but I got the general I feel like I know a lot about the brain that I knew yeah. before um really research like this what's going on the science of it the the anatomy and all of that um and then he kind of took it on himself to really jump right into the research of what's being done uh, for treatment. And, and so, yes, he became kind of like the expert in that. And like, we have like database of, of just so much information in that way. And, um, you know, he's, he's such a, he's a really smart person to begin with, but he's a very creative thinker. And so knowing that he like has his mind focused on that to me, it like gives me such peace because uh -huh. I feel like if anyone is gonna solve something like this, it's going to be someone like him because yeah. we have skin in the game. He cares. Like, this is not just like a job or like, this is our son. This is our, mm. our, our future um, or our son's future too. So it's, that's the one thing that has been kind of, I guess, hopeful in the situation, but we, you know, we both went to all of the appointments and just kind of 
um, you, I, I don't have a background in medicine. I'm a social worker, but I, you, you become like pretty versed in the medical, like just from being in it. So I feel like, um, yeah, I, I know a pendemoma. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, a, a parent said it really good on this podcast once it's like, well, when your child's life is on the line, like you get educated yeah. real fast exactly. because you really exactly. don't have a choice. Right. right. And so, and, and I think, you know, especially with something like the pandemoma and probably a lot of brain cancers in general, there's like, there's so little information out there. Like it's not, it's not a huge chunk of time to really read everything that's out there because, yeah. it's, you know, there's not a lot of, um, it's not like this overflowing with sure. resources and people yeah. thinking about it and trying to solve it. Speaking of that, were you able to connect with any other families or communities during that time? Or were you not quite quite ready yet or what worked for you? I think, you know, for the first like six months after diagnosis to maybe even like a year, I was just in like autopilot, just trying to like survive, yeah. get us all through. After about a year, I found, I, I, of course, like, you know, I'm a social worker, so I'm always like thinking about like hmm. those connections. And so I, I did reach out to like the social workers on the ho hospital staff. Child life was always super helpful when we were like inpatient. Um, and then I started to look for like support groups. There's not much locally, but I found a strong kind of uh, online community and I got involved in that. And so then I started to kind of grow my, Yeah. Um, I do remember I did talk to like someone on the phone early on. I don't remember the conversation, but just knowing that it was another like a yeah. mom was helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, I, I definitely reached out where I could. We'll be right back. We are sponsored by Magic Mind, which is the world's first productivity drink. And if y'all have been following along with me for a while, you know I rely heavily on caffeine, especially that 2 p.m. coffee to help me be productive when I'm working on Child Life on Call or podcasting or being a mom. But that inevitable crash happens, and so I've been looking for something to help me be more productive without all the caffeine. James Bashera, who's the creator of Magic Mind, had a similar issue. His doctor made him give up caffeine because of a heart condition. So he worked to put all these ingredients together with food scientists and physicians and to come together with Magic Mind. I take it after I drink my coffee in the morning, and it helps make me feel productive for the rest of the day. So for Child Life on Call listeners, if you go to Magic Mind, dot co slash child life on call you enter code child life on call 20 you get 20 percent off your order so magic mind dot co slash child life on call enter child life on call 20 and you get 20 percent off your order i truly hope you enjoy the benefits of this like i did go to magic mind dot co slash child life on call yeah and thinking about you as a social worker too it, I I struggle with this myself as like a child life specialist and it's hard to wear both hats at the same time. And it's like, am I looking at this too, like within the lens of child life? Am I mom enough? It's hard to know where you find yourself. And you can't like, you know, social work your family, right? Like I, I'm, I'm mom first and, like, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Know, so, and that's most important. And, and that was actually been, I think really important in this process to, to call on other people. Like when mm. I felt like they were needed, you know, so like, you know, I knew at one point I wanted my son to see like a therapist as he got a little older to kind of maybe process some of this. I was like, that's not me. Right. But it's great. Right. I can help find someone and find a good match, which, you know, I did. So I think, it's helpful to have the skills, but you really have to know when to kind of turn them off. Um, yeah. because it's, I was feeling overwhelmed at, well, I would think I would feel overwhelmed without yeah. the social work knowledge, but, um, again, like my husband, it's like, sometimes, you know, a little too much. And, sure. and, um, so it, yeah, just trying to kind of put that aside and be mom because that's, you know, that's yeah. really what everyone needs. And what about big sister? How, and by the way, how old is your son now? So he's five now. He's five now. Okay. And how did big sister handle the separation from brother during treatment okay. and watching you guys go through all this? That was really hard for her. She was four at the time that he was diagnosed. She was in preschool. 
but it was like a year of the uh, crazy flu. I remember, I don't know if you remember. And, and like, so we actually kept her out of preschool for like six weeks while he was getting treatment um, because he couldn't get sick because they, that means they would stop the treatment. So it was really hard for her because so much changed all at once. Um, and she was she's very close to both my husband and I. Um, and so to have one of us not there was difficult. Um, I worked really hard to have like, you know, special time with her when I was home, to have like a relative um, who she's very close with, have special time with her when she was when I wasn't home. Mm-hmm. And we tried to kind of make it as like, you know, kind of normal as possible, but it was so not normal. Um, (laughs) And that's kind of how this book that uh, I wrote, like grew out of that experience, because I I was really trying to find anything, tools for her to like, to, to help explain what she was going through. She's a kid that's like a very big um, feeler, and not as much verbal at first, she needs to kind of like chew on it, and then she'll come up with something, even at four, she was like, wow. Yeah. You know, so I knew that I needed like something to kind of like draw out the conversation with her so we could have a conversation. And, um, so I was looking for like books or something, anything just to like, you know, I found like dolls with no hair, but that wasn't really re- like that. That was not her experience. Um, mm. so I ended up, um, I found one book. It was like very dark. <laughs> like the pictures were very dark. And I was like, this is scary. So the, yeah. so, um, I ended up writing this book uh, to kind of help her understand like, A, that like kids get sick, right? They go to the hospital um, and the kids get better sometimes, um, but more about knowing like that the hospital doesn't have to be this scary place. So mm-hmm. we, you know, when we could, we brought her to the hospital to visit her brother. We did that like a few times, um, but once the book um came out, which was a little bit after, you know, he had been home and all of that. It was like a year or two. Um, She, both of them were looking at like, oh, that's kind of like what happened to my brother. She said, and I was like, exactly. You know, it was was very like touching that she kind of saw that similarity um, and um, could see that like, I I wanted to just kind of normalize that like, you know, you're going to know someone in your world as a kid that goes to the hospital, either as a sibling or a friend or a relative, that's just, it's going to happen at some point. And to not be like afraid of it, to be able to talk about it before it becomes super scary. And so, you know, I think hopefully this book can do that for a lot of kids, but it certainly helped for her to be able to talk about, um, you know, what was going on. And, And for my son, when he saw it, you know, he didn't want to dive deep and that's fine. He was talking about the pretty pictures and the colors and, you know, kids are going to take it where they need it at the moment. And, and that's what I love about like books and tools. It's like there it's, they'll use it how they want to use it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, instead I found them, my son, he, we have like a doctor's kid and he was like always doctoring like the teddy bears. I was like, Oh, that's fascinating. Right. Yeah, (laughs) Um, that's that's how he wanted to like process it. So, yeah. um, It's so true. You can read a book five times and have five totally different experiences with it based on what your child's able to to handle at that moment. Yeah. And what, what's the name of your book called? Will Jack's be home for Thanksgiving? Will Jack's be home for Thanksgiving. (laughs) Oh, um, and so I want to go back to you a little bit, you know, retrospectively looking back, what do you think helped you get through each day? Um, the most, I guess, if you could, if you could choose a few things that helped you get out of bed and just continue on. I think one is just my family kind of seeing my daughter, seeing my husband and seeing my son, like we were, we, (laughs) in this moment, we're all together. And that felt like a huge motivation to kind of keep, I, the one thing that I kind of said when, when my son was first diagnosed is that if he survives this experience like I want our life to be as normal as possible like what like as he's once he's recovered like I I want him to have like a a childhood and as like as good a life as he can for as long as he can and that has always been like my motivation for him and for our whole family that like just that I want us to live 
to live, right? To, to be experienced life because you're, you're not guaranteed it, right? So if you have it, take it and, and, and honor that. And um, so I, that's always kind of in the back of my head that like, well, here I am breathing. Like, Mm -hmm. so let me, let Mm -hmm. me get up and, and face the day. And not that there are not challenges. I I don't mean to like sugarcoat any of this. It is not always easy. Um, But that is, that I think is what keeps me going. Just knowing that I have a choice, right? I could, I could give up. I could, you know, put the covers over my head and, Mm -hmm. and, and just give up. And, and I certainly have felt like that. And I do feel like that sometimes it's, it's not that that feeling isn't there, but um, I think I've just chosen, uh, you know, for as much as I can to be as present as I can. Yeah. Uh, and just do the best I can. And, and so, yes, again, I think just thinking the other thing that has helped is just being in the moment as much as possible. And so for me, like, you know, exercise helps me do that or meditating. Like I had a strong yoga and meditation practice before all of this mm. and, um, you know, that has continued and, you know, just whatever it is for each person, I know it's different, but like to have something that just brings you to be in the present. Cause I think you, you can't, the second I start worrying about, well, you know, the future or what's it like, will he make it to high school? Will he make it to will he get his driver's license with all these things, you know, like yeah. it's yeah. too much and it it's doesn't too much. help anyone. And it just, you go into like crazy mind. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I think trying to be, you know, and so it's like simple, like, you know, trying to get sleep when I can sleep, like, you know, that whole like six months without <laughs> sleep wasn't good for me. So, no. and I still like, I can say that's probably one of my current, like, that's a challenge that I, I think this experience has left me with, like, I don't sleep well anymore. Like, I just, that's, that's, yeah. you know, what's happened. Yeah. Um, but I'm aware of that. And I try to, you know, I try all sorts of things to, yeah. <laughs> To fix it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. More milk and well, you, well, you, you, for sleep. And <laughs> well, you have um, you have lots of reasons to to keep yourself up at night. You know, you've right. been through a lot. Um, yeah. So I would love to know what your son has taught you through this process. Maybe either something about life or yourself that he specifically gave to you. Yeah, I think for him, he he has such a positive and strong like personality and attitude that he is a type of person that has can be positive no matter what, like minus the like inpatient time in the hospital. Since then he goes, he shows up at like, we get, you know, regular scans and all sorts of appointments. He's like, when he, even when he had the radiation, he got to press the button and pick the color. And he was like having a blast. He's like, when do we get to see nurse so-and-so? And, And, you know, he was going there to play. He thought it was like his playhouse, which it was not. Um, But he just brings such a like joy and energy and zest for life. And that um, is something that I, I really respect about him and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, hope to do the same. It's like, he, nothing can stop him. Nothing has, you know, that's amazing. Um, so. What a testament to your hospital as well, you exactly. know, for letting him have that childlike experience yes. in the and hospital. They were amazing. They and were where amazing. did you guys get treatment? Um, he got treated at children's hospital for, uh, in Boston mm-hmm. uh, also for his surgery. And then he went to mass general hospital for his radiation. And then is followed at, a uh, like, Dana Farber, Jimmy Fund for kind of oh, online, wow. which is affiliated with um, children. Yeah. So, yeah, we've just been so lucky. But the the radiation piece, which was intense, right? It's every it's five days a week for six weeks. Um, and it was like in the middle of the winter, and you know, and we're driving. It was horrible. But like six in the morning, <laughs> he had to be sedated for every every radiation because he was so young and you have to be still. So he had anesthesia for six weeks straight basically, but he would show up there. I mean, it's like horrible, right? He'd show up there and like, you know, there would be toys to play with and, and the nurses were so amazing. The doctors were amazing and they were just, they, they really cared. And, and I could feel that and I'm sure he could too. So he was in good hands. Well, big shout out to that hospital for yes, making serious. that experience which for 
all aspects should have been completely traumatic and and wasn't. Yeah. yeah. No, I would be like crying in the car driving there just because it was so terrible. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> like, do 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Gosh, we have so much to learn from our kids. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the one thing too, you know, so as I said, he's five now. He has no memory of this. I mean, no, I mean, I'm sure there's like, of course, like the residual trauma that I'm very aware of that we <laughs> process, but, but in terms of like a kid, he does not remember the surgery, the scan, uh, the, the radiation. We do go for court quarterly scans and he does remember those, but that's like different. Um, mm-hmm. so, but yeah, he, he, so in a way he's kind of like moved past it. Right. Cause it's sure. it something that is, it's all yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What a, what a gift for you sharing this though, because I imagine when he's older, Right. That's when kind of those thoughts will come back up of what was that like and um, having your your very like loving and thoughtful uh, story being shared like this. I I can only see as a gift for him to be able to know what happened because I would want to know, you know, what happened that I don't remember to like, you know, talk about it, understand it. And, Mm. you know, as much as he wants, as as much that would be helpful to him. But yes, I agree. I think if something like that. I had a traumatic kind of birth, like, you know, and I was in the hospital as a a newborn for a long time and I have no idea. Right. I don't remember that, but I have so many questions for my parents. What was it like? What was going on? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. You want to kind of know those things. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being so vulnerable with us and, and sharing your family story. Is there anything else that we left out that you feel like you wanted to share or you want other parents to know? Just to know that like, you're not alone. It might feel like I, you feel like you're alone yeah. when you first hear these words, this diagnosis, but that um, the more you can kind of reach out and connect to people that have been through something similar, there's so much support in this community that um, <laughs> the joyful noises of children. <laughs> right, right. That's life. Um, yeah, but that that yeah, it's not it. It feels like life could never go on when you hear us kind of like difficult news, but but it always does. Even no matter, it might not look like what you expected it to look like, and you can't even plan for what it will look like. But but it always does go on, and yeah. that you know that is a gift. Oh, also, well, thank you so much for being here today. And if yeah. we want to buy your book, how can we do that? Yeah. So um, my husband and I created a foundation to support research toward ependymoma and all the profits from the book support that research. So it goes directly okay. to the foundation. So it's called the Ependymoma Research Foundation. And then we have okay. a website, ependymomaresearchfoundation.org. And um, you can buy it on the website. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I'll make sure I link to all that. And yes. Appreciate it's a, it's a you. Mouthful to- <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Child Life On Call podcast. I'm your host, Katie Taylor, and you can follow us at Child Life On Call on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please rate and review to make it easier for other families to find us. We have cute merch available at www.bonfire.com slash store slash Child Life On Call. And you can listen to more episodes and find resources at childlifepodcast.com. <laughs>